If there is a neutrality in Afghanistan which could complement a peace agreement with Taliban, of course, it has to be regionally uh, negotiated and internationally sanctioned. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Next Page, the podcast designed to advance the conversation on multilateralism. My name is Katrine Lungse and I work here at the UN Library and Archives, Geneva. In today's episode, you're going to be hearing from Dr. Nasir Andisha, who is currently the ambassador and permanent representative of Afghanistan to the UN here in Geneva. Dr. Andisha spoke to our director, Francesco Pisano, about his recently released book called Neutrality in Vulnerable States and about some of the basic concepts which lies behind it. They also spoke about the future of Afghanistan in the light of the U.S.'s decision to withdraw their troops from the country and how this can affect regional and permanent neutrality. But without spoiling too much of the conversation, I'm just going to let you listen to it. So without further ado, here you have it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Next Page, our podcast library and archives designed to advance the conversation on multilateralism. Today, I am very happy because I have with us an ambassador, permanent representative, and friend of the library and archives, Dr. Nasir Andisha. He is the current permanent representative of Afghanistan to the UN in Geneva. He's been deputy foreign minister of Afghanistan in the, in the late uh, 2015 up to 2019. He's been also ambassador to Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji, and is a former staff of the International Committee of the Red Cross in the field. He was a field officer, but he'll tell us about himself a little bit. And welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you very much uh, for having me, and it's a great pleasure to be here in this historical building. You know, uh, I consider it as a, as a major and important source of uh, multilateral knowledge. So, pleasure. Great to have you here. I'm really, I'm really proud we managed to catch you uh, in, the, in the second or third year of your, of your assignment here as, as ambassador. So for those in the, who are listening who don't know you, could you please just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about your career as a diplomat and also as a Minister of Foreign Affairs? Uh, yes, um, I'm, I'm a career diplomat with the Afghanistan Foreign Service. And uh, in fact, I started my work, uh, as you mentioned, uh, with the International Committee of the Red Cross. I consider that also part of the humanitarian diplomacy. I started with the age of almost 20 years old. I was a student of medical college in mazar sharif when the, our university was attacked by Taliban. I have to leave university to save myself. So I came back to my native place uh, north of Kabul in Kapisa province. And there, because of a little bit of uh, knowledge of medicine and a little bit of English, so I was recruited by the International Committee of the Red Cross. But that's when I started working with the international, internationals, with, you know, with NGOs and the others. And soon after uh, 9-11, I joined the Afghanistan Ministry of Foreign Affairs because they needed uh, people with that knowledge and capacity, and, and, and most of us from the organization. So since 2001, honestly, early two, uh, I, I, I started working with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, in between also I did my education in service uh, in the United States uh, and in Australia, and here I am, you know, fast-tracked as an ambassador. And today you're here also as an author and a researcher, and uh, we're going to talk about your latest book called Neutrality and Vulnerable States. It was published by uh, Rutledge Focus mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, uh, or last year, last if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, when I went through the book, I found it fascinating. And so before we go deep into the book um, for our listeners, let's talk a little bit about neutrality. And this is all the more interesting for us because in multilateral studies, there is a lot of research on peace and conflict. But there's very little, actually, scientific and academic literature about neutrality. And you went in there and you, and you studied the topic. So 
for our listeners who are not very familiar with the concept, can you just tell them, you know, a quick definition of neutrality and why it is beneficial for some states? Uh, you know, the very simple definition, the dictionary definition of neutrality is uh, a strict and transparent po- uh, impartiality. Yeah. So, uh, and we hear a lot these days about net neutrality and neutrality of this and that in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the cyberspace. But the, the neutrality that we are talking about, and as you also alluded, uh, in, uh, in, in diplomacy and in diplomatic conflict resolution, neutrality is a diplomatic tool uh, which is used often. Uh, you're right that you know, we always talk about war and peace, but this is a step toward either war or peace. Uh, um, so it's a diplomatic tool used uh, in, in many, many occasions uh, to change a situation of military stalemate into a political one and then to move to stability. So I think it's, in one hand, it's a diplomatic tool. But in terms of uh, uh, our own discussion today and relevant to, to the book uh, that I published, uh, neutrality is seen as a foreign and security policy choice of mostly uh, small states in between states uh, with which, with that choice, uh, they uh, decide not to take part in others' conflict during major conflicts, regional conflicts, wars, but also during peace, they try to keep away from military packs and military and security intelligence. So they keep themselves away both in peace and in war. So that's called a policy, foreign and security policy of neutrality. What made you research the topic and publish the book now? So uh, uh, there is a gap between research and the book, uh, but but I can you know, answer both. Uh, in terms of the research, when I was ambassador to Australia, we had a great university there and also a department which was uh, had a very good knowledge of the Asia Pacific and Afghanistan uh, at the same time. So uh, throughout my my you know. Um, high school and later on, I was always uh, fascinated by the history of Afghanistan, the history of empires, the history of conquerors, the history of invasions, and a place always, you know, at at least for 200 years in turmoil. Uh, And and then I looked at a country like Australia, like Switzerland, where, you know, incidentally I became an ambassador. Uh, and, and, I, and we were always thinking that, you know, what is the way out of these things? Because the, most of the region uh, around us, which in, 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 in the history we were either part of an empire or uh, we were, you know, uh, kind of uh, an empire which was based in Afghanistan or in Iran and there, they slowly through past hundred years, they, they, they uh, stabilized, they settled down, you know, the countries are... Uh, moving and improving, and the only place which is the core of all this region, we call it heart of Asia, is a still in turmoil. So what are some of the ways that we can you know, address this issue? So that's why I came across this uh, question of neutrality a number of times. So that fascinates me, and I understood that it's a difficult one, and you mentioning that's why you know, uh, there's very little literature. But I still insisted, I start working on it, and uh, I research neutrality looking into Austria, Switzerland, as the both very you know, successful neutrals, taking themselves out of the conflict. But also I looked at Laos, which uh, was a country which was not part of the main conflict. It was you know, a subsidiary of Vietnam War, but they couldn't uh, you know, succeed in a neutrality, and Afghanistan. So that was my research interest. And later on, I kept it. I became deputy foreign minister and didn't have time. But, the, uh, but then again in 2014 and later on, uh, when I looked at the, so the, the re-emergence of some sort of you know, new Cold War and the ideas, you know, what happened in Georgia, of course, the 2008, and then Ukraine, and, and, and now in Yemen and the other places, and I looked at, you know, the, some, some elements of a new sort of, you know, regional and international conflict, I looked at neutrality as a valid concept, not only for Afghanistan, which certainly is, and we are going to talk about it, but most, but the most of the areas which you know is called the fault lines of geopolitics. So that was my interest, and then I quickly you know focused on it in the past uh, year and a half in uh, Switzerland. I had some time you know coming out of Kabul, and uh, I made it small because you know it has to be quickly published uh, because of the importance of the subject itself. And uh, here it is, you know, in a small book, readable, 
uh, but uh, talking about a major subject, uh, which is neutrality for vulnerable states. And we know in here, in Geneva, that there are many, many vulnerable states around the world. Indeed, the book uh, is very readable. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that it's part of our collection here at the library. And um, I hope that many people will, uh, will, will, get, will get to read it. But before we get into our deep dive into the book, just one more question for the benefit of our, of our listeners. In the book, use terms such as new neutrality and new Cold War. Just, you know, briefly, what is new about the neutrality you talk about and what is the new Cold War? Uh, neutrality, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a foreign and security policy, uh, was, of course, defined... Uh, uh, first by the Congress of Vienna 1815, when the neutrality of uh, Switzerland, but also the Benelux countries was recognized. But later on it was codified in 1907. There's a Hague Convention basically on neutrality. So neutrality is defined in contrast to war. So when there is a war, there is neutrality. Uh, otherwise, you know, why should be neutral? So the, but when it moved toward the Cold War, there was not a real war basically there, but there was a kind of, you know, uh, proxy wars around it. So in terms of the international relation literature, neutrality was still relevant during the Cold War because we had Austria as a, you know, as a result of a Cold War, uh, I mean, the beginning of the Cold War, an agreement of the powers during peace uh, to have a neutral Austria, but later on, uh, Laos. So there was still justification for neutrality during Cold War. But when Cold War was over, suddenly this whole idea of liberal internationalism you know, became the main uh, uh, focus everywhere. We have you know, the books like End of History, things like this. But then people thought, I mean, why we should be neutral? And that's why there are lots of questions, even within the European neutrals, that the time is over, let's you know, be all of us one bloc. Which uh, Switzerland resisted that, but in Austria and the others, there is still uh, Sweden, no Ireland. Uh, so when I was when I'm talking about new neutrality, that because we all know that this you know this uh, fervor and and, and this uh, uh, you know uh, this high hopes of liberal order uh, only survived in in the uh, late 90s. So with it you know with the second term of Putin, with the rise of China and all this, we see some elements of uh, a new Cold War. I mean, this is, of course, in a, in a term which you have to be used it with grain of salt. But I, if you can look at the literature, people are talking about it, and the flashpoints are, again, you know, Georgia uh, and Ukraine uh, uh, in hot spots, basically, but then Africa, and, and there are many other places that we, they are talking about as, uh, as the uh, places of, of uh, an emergence of a new Cold War. What will be the the nature of new Cold War, how cold it will be, how hot it will be, is something that we have to wait and see. But, but with that, I think, and of course not only me, there are a few others, thinking that there is a need for re-emergence of new neutrality. And to be honest, I think I can give the credit to, of course, the guru of international and security policies, which is Dr. Kissinger, who uh, mentioned this when it comes to the question of Ukraine and Georgia. They said, look, these areas... Uh, need to be neutralized, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, it could be perpetual conflict and it can draw the region, especially Europe uh, and, and Russia. And so let's go into your book, which is a result of years of research, and um, it, will be, it will be important that we give a sense to our listeners of what's in the book, the results of your research, and what is that you are driving to towards in, in your conclusion. So let's go into that. And um, having read the book, I got the sense that more or less 200 years of history of Afghanistan could be seen as semi-evidence that periods of neutrality have coincided with periods of stability and peace. And there is no doubt that Afghanistan is located in those fault lines of, of important geopolitical tensions. This is very clear also from, from your research. But does this position necessarily mean that the country is a good candidate for permanent neutrality? 200 years of history, yeah. If you look at that, 
history of Afghanistan and the geography that you mentioned. So the two factors, which are very important for the you know, students of international relations, which is history and geography. Uh, if you look at history and you look at the geography of Afghanistan and geopolitics of Afghanistan, the answer is uh, a definite yes. But then uh, that makes it desirable. But is it feasible? And in terms of feasibility, you have then other factors, which I have uh, elaborated in the book, looking into the case studies, which I mentioned, Switzerland, uh, Austria, Laos, and a few others, which, uh, of course, have not been deeply studied, but mentioned. Belgium, uh, Ireland, even the United States at one point. So two other factors, economic factors and cultural and ideational factors. So I think these two factors are still lacking uh, for Afghanistan uh, to be you know, a successful neutral country. So if I concluded that there are existing elements in Afghanistan which tells us that historic history and geography dictate us to move toward neutrality. But then there are other factors that we have to work as Afghans, but also as region, to make sure that Afghanistan neutrality could be, first of all, uh, could be upheld, respected, and it could be you know, a successful one, because it's, it's easy for a policy of neutrality to fail. And we saw it in a number of places. From your research, what kind of conclusions do you draw? Does Afghanistan have the criteria for permanent neutrality or not? Now, you seem to indicate that there are important parts that are still, that need development if Afghanistan wants to move towards neutrality. What is your assessment of the country right now? So, uh, again, uh, looking into the literature, into the history uh, of neutrality, you have, uh, for the you know, simplification of, of discussion, you have uh, domestic uh, factors and you have regional international factors in neutrality uh, to be successful. In terms of, uh, you know, uh, as I say, geopolitical factors, Afghanistan is a country uh, that fits the geopolitical characteristics of a neutral uh, country which uh, I defined it as strategically significant but not vital for any of the powers. Because if a power thinks that a place is strategically vital for it, and that's in the vicinity of that power, they will do everything to control it. And we have, you know, I don't need to mention the, <laughs> uh, the examples. Uh, so, but then the country is strategically important, but not, but not vital, but not vital, still the countries around will be happy with that country not becoming at least a source of problem, a source of tension. I think this is a, this is a factor. Uh, uh, and then uh, difficult geographical terrain is another one. Some like you know here in, in Switzerland, Afghanistan is a mountainous country. It's very very difficult for any country to control it. It you know costs a lot controlling Afghanistan. So that's another thing. Uh, and, uh, and in terms of you know, uh, being a buffer state in the past, uh, and, and historically it's a, you know, a multi-ethnic country, a diverse country which has ethnicities which crosses the current borders of Afghanistan. I think these are the, uh, the profiles, these are the characteristics which makes Afghanistan fit for it. Uh, and then the, the consensus of regional powers. I think this can also drive a consensus because at least in the past uh, 20 years there was a consensus on Afghanistan uh, at the UN level. United Nations Security Council, I think Afghanistan is perhaps one of those very few places where P5 uh, agrees uh, continuously on a UN mission and you know, uh, on, on the security um, uh, assistant missions in Afghanistan. So there is, uh, uh, maybe there are some small kind of, kind of you know, disagreements among the P5, but not, not a major one. At the region, yes, it is, but you know, they solvable. So the two characteristics can tell us that yes. But the other, the other simple characteristics of a, a, a neutral country is that a country, a neutral country, should be able, minimum, minimum, to, uh, to finance to support its own military force by its own domestic revenue. Because the minute you ask support from somewhere else, of course, uh, it, it will be dictated uh, or it will be seen, basically, even if it's not, you know, if even it, 
the support is benevolent, but, but then the other side, the, because there's always a neutral country, there are different uh, uh, powers, different interests uh, uh, externally. The other external side will see that, look, you know, if your military is dependent on that, and that's what our fate in, in 1960s and 70s, where we were more or less dependent on Soviet Union in terms of our military hardware. Uh, while we try to be neutral and non-aligned, but, but, but <laughs> without knowing, we actually went into the embrace of the Soviet Union, and that was when, when our army was trained there, when all of our military equipments were Russians. And so, of course, our, our, our army became communist, and then they had a coup. So I think that's, that's a very important element. So to, to, to be able, and we are not able to do that right now. I think that's one thing that I'm thinking, that, that how we should be able to support our army, should be small, not a big one, to be able to defend the country in case of there any invasion, which I, I know that you know, no, nobody's going to invade overtly Afghanistan anymore, hopefully. Uh, but uh, but, but you know, we should not be dependent on anyone and on this. And the other thing is our um, cultural and ideational one, because throughout the history we have been part of empires and also we have been source of empires in that region, and we have you know, cross-ethnic communities. And there is always this, these ideas in, ingrained in the Afghan psyche that this is a great nation, this is you know, the source of civilizations from the Indus to Oxus rivers, things like this, which needs to sort of you know, calm down. And this was the question I asked, uh, because I, I quoted, I will quote him, I, I don't want his name, one of the Austrian ambassadors. And I tell like, you know, how you agree, you know, these Australians, you're the base of a, one of the biggest empires, Austro-Hungarian empire, and then suddenly you reduced in a small country, and still you accepted neutrality. So what, how, what, how was the feeling of at least the royal you know, family and the others? And the debate you had, because it, at that time they had two major political parties. So you went to Moscow, you signed the state treaty, and you became neutral. He gave me a very good answer. And I tried to you know, keep mentioning that answer in a more simple way to my uh, friends and to my colleagues and to my counterparts and, and countrymen in Afghanistan. That Look, the Austrian ambassador told me that what remained after the war was Austria. What's gone were perhaps not Austria. So we have to live with what's remained, and we have to keep what's remained as Austria. So I think that is the case in today's world, in 20th century, 21st century. Many countries are not happy with what they are, because they lost their limbs, they lost their parts. But we have to come to the reality that what remains is Afghanistan, and, and the definition of Afghanistan is the geography of today's Afghanistan. And this country can turn inward to become a neutral place and stay in peace within the different ethnicities. Uh, and, and I saw this in the history of neutrality of Austria, I mean Switzerland sometime, that what will be the sort of emotional connection of German uh, Swiss toward, uh, will that be used by Germany during the Second World War or the First World War? The same for the French and the others. But somehow, you know, the national identity becomes so strong on the basis of neutrality because the central government, the federal government, could not be seen to incline toward one of your region which has co-ethnics. I think that's another uh, most important element for us. Uh, but the good thing is that I see now the debate of neutrality is taking root in Afghanistan and it's coming uh, from within Afghanistan. In the past, if you see in my book, mostly the proposals of neutrality was coming from outside. But now there is a certain discussion and my little book is stirring this discussion also in Kabul. And to your point there, at one point you mentioned in your, in your book that the idea of a permanent neutrality for Afghanistan had been flagged already in 2009. Mm. And then it was sort of um, uh, replaced or, or, or sidelined by the Istanbul process. Mm. And can you tell us a little bit more about this process? Uh, Yes, 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 certainly I can tell you about that, and that was when I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, researching uh, this book. But before that, just you know, one one minute, I can I can take you back in history a little bit. That the uh, that the idea of neutrality or Afghanistan become a permanent neutral 
also has another very interesting, fascinating history, which I'm sure your you know, audience will like it, is that in 1980, like immediately after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the idea of Afghanistan becoming a permanent neutral was an initiative by Lord Carrington, who was the foreign secretary of Britain. So he proposed. It went all the way around and it went up to, I think, the uh, United Nations, but there it stopped, was that we will declare Afghanistan a neutral country in condition that it will provide a face-saving uh, umbrella for the Soviet to withdraw its troops. So Afghanistan could be a neutral country, but the Soviet Union could uh, withdraw its force. It was, you know, at the, at the very beginning of this. And they proposed at that time a sort of, you know, a Soviet-friendly neutrality, which is called Finland's, uh, you know, approach to neutrality, or Finlandization. I know our, you know, Finnish colleagues, they don't like this term, but this is there in the history. So uh, sort of, you know, a, fit, uh, a Finland-style arrangement, but uh, but neither the Soviet Union at the time and nor our Communist Party didn't accept it. They thought that this is sort of you know a, a very Western plot that they wanted to neutralize Afghanistan first and then they come in uh, themselves. So that was the first uh, uh, official one before uh, this 2011. In 2009, when President Obama came in, I mean his policies was that of course uh, uh, that you have to get out of Iraq, a bad war but also to manage the good war, which was Afghanistan. But there, uh, also the Obama administration with uh, Vice President Biden, who is now the President Biden, uh, and a number of diplomats like uh, late uh, Richard Holbrook, so they came with this idea of you know, how to look into the exit strategy from Afghanistan. The exit strategy was that we make a search and increase the areas of control, deliver you know, uh, a blow to the Taliban, and some, you know, state, uh, they call the state in the box. You know, you can roll the state services. But then we will withdraw. You know, an increase, a surge, and a withdrawal. But this, the exit was also complemented by a regional policy. It has to be a regional settlement with the region and a peace uh, effort, even at that time with Taliban, also with the region. So the idea of neutrality was one of the two variants, maybe plan A or plan B, I don't know which one, of a regional, creating a regional consensus. A base for a regional consensus was that we will get out of Afghanistan, we, US and NATO, and the region has to agree, Russia, China, Iran, you know, Pakistan, India, Saudi Arabia, all of this, on a neutral Afghanistan. So it shouldn't be a source of tension. And in fact, this was raised in a number of uh, articles against uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, James Dobbins, who was a special envoy, Carl Underford, who was the undersecretary of, uh, of that region, but, but more uh, uh, prominently, Secretary Clinton herself in 2011, I can, if I can remember, it was June 2011, and I mentioned that episode in my book, in a closed uh, uh, interaction with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, she mentioned that if we can get into a settlement similar, again, she mentions the Vienna Convention of 1815, uh, a settlement where the Benelux countries became a free zone. So if we can reach an agreement with the regional powers around Afghanistan in a similar arrangement, it will be a success story. But then, uh, of course, uh, 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 since you know, it, was, it was very difficult to develop this at that time, and, uh, and, uh, and the, the other plan, which was, no, we need a regional diplomatic platform, uh, which Turkey, as an ally, can, uh, can chair, but United States and the NATO countries could be there. Membership will be regional. They have 12 regional countries around Afghanistan, but also supported with a second circle, which is United States, you know, Europe, EU, and the others. So the idea of the Istanbul process was a regional political confidence building uh, project, which actually was good because it was ending toward you know coming to to. Uh, uh, an agreement where the region will slowly take uh, over and the United States will leave. But then we know that what happened after 2012 and 13 in the Middle East, the Syria crisis, Turkey itself uh, was uh, basically, you know, got busy with its own neighborhood. And that's why the, the idea of the Istanbul process moved but couldn't really succeed. And that's why after 10 years, we are coming back to discussion of neutrality. And here we are, indeed, 10 years, 10 years later, uh, on the verge of um, many options for the future of Afghanistan. And 
And if you allow me, I would like to shift the conversation now to the future. Let's talk about the future. This is a very important moment for your country. We are in 2021. The U.S. has publicly said and repeated they're going to withdraw the troops. There is a lot of talking about this, the effects that this may have on the future of your country. The press is, you know, full of articles and analysis. In your book, though, you also say something that really stuck with me. And you, you say, and I'm quoting, exploring international, internationally backed regional neutrality and non-aggression arrangements is a more realistic policy than the permanent neutrality of a single state. So based on that, on that statement of yours, and now that the U.S. has decided to withdraw all troops, is that policy in a better position to succeed? Is it feasible? You see, it's a, it's a difficult uh, question to, to answer, especially you know, when it comes to future, we have to be very careful because you know, in, if, you, if you forecast something pessimistic for future, and, and, uh, so nobody will come to, to take you. But if you have you know, a very open one and, and a very positive one, then, then uh, of course, uh, and if it not happen, you will be blamed for it. But anyway, it's my country and I have to be very optimistic about it. So, uh, where we are right now, uh, it looks like neutrality of Afghanistan, a permanent neutrality of Afghanistan, which has to be, as I mentioned in, in the book there, it was uh, a year and a half, two years back. We didn't know much that we know right now about the withdrawal and things like this. Uh, if it is supported seriously by P5 and our region, it offers a win-win situation uh, for all of us. And even for the pessimists, it uh, prevents a loss-loss uh, 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 situation because it will be, if, if Afghanistan enters into another era of civil war and chaos, uh, it will be a loss, of course, for us, certainly. We are, you know, right now in, in a very intense uh, period of conflict, losing lots of, you know, our... our compatriots, uh, schools, universities, uh, doctors, uh, hospitals, nowhere is safe uh, from this, you know, uh, heinous attacks. But that can multiply, you know, that can even be going into worse situation, God forbid, toward, you know, what happened in situation of uh, uh, civil wars in, in places like Africa or in, in the Balkans, uh, uh, those kind of, you know, mass uh, atrocities. So that will be a loss for us, but also for the region, because the fallout will be uh, seen much stronger in our region, but also in Europe, in terms of the refugees, in terms of all this, you know, uh, terrorist group which are now hanging around Afghanistan, they could be freed up. So I'm saying that this is a very realistic. Some people think that neutrality is an idealistic you know, or liberal kind of thing, but I say, no, 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 neutrality is a very realistic concept. For Afghanistan, it will save, it will protect our sovereignty. For the region... It will, you know, prevent a, 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 you know, a catastrophic uh, fallout. So uh, we, uh, it's desirable. It seems that, you know, for most of the countries, but to uh, to make it uh, feasible, we need uh, serious diplomatic uh, efforts, both at the local level. We Afghans, we have to come among uh, ourselves. We sit. And we agree on some principles of neutrality that, you know, these are the principles that we have to defend it because it's our, uh, it will be our policy. Like, you know, one community has a country by the name of that community in, the, in, the, in some part of the world. They shouldn't be seen as, you know, uh, connected or, or supporting the whatever policy comes from there. So I think first, number one is uh, at the domestic level. Regional diplomacy is needed, and this is what we are trying to do with the region, that the neutral Afghanistan doesn't mean that we shut off others. No, we don't want to, you know, get involved in the others, or we don't want to be a pawn in the sort of, you know, proxy regional conflict, but economically we will be open to everyone. You know, it's Afghanistan is a crossroad of, uh, of South and Central Asia with all that untapped minerals. I think we offer that, you know, for the prosperity of, of our region. And it is, there, is a, there is an international UN level, especially Security Council level uh, diplomacy is needed. So we have to get three levels, Afghanistan, the Afghans, which 
again, as I said in the past, it was you know either Lord Carrington or Secretary Clinton, but now it's slowly taking root within discussions for Afghanistan. Our president has mentioned this a number of times, and now it's coming into the uh, discussion within the country itself. So there are some debates, lots of disagreements, but some agreements. And regional level, Pakistan, India, you know, Iran, China, and the others, we have to work with them bilaterally to create what I call it in the book again, the balance of interest instead of balance of power. So their balance of their interest has to be balanced and, and agreed upon. And then, then the question of uh, the question of P5, so Security Council. If there is a neutrality in Afghanistan, which could complement a peace agreement with Taliban, of course, it has to be regionally uh, negotiated and internationally sanctioned. And that's how we see it. And UN uh, uh, will be you know, involved in, in this uh, question of neutrality. And this is how, you know, as, a, as an Afghan, as an Afghan diplomat with, you know, who lived in the country throughout, uh, I could see a way out. It is difficult. It has a lot of idealistic, you know, things in it. Hundred questions could be asked to me of what I see it right now, but but I see this perhaps as a road not traveled. We travel many other roads. It it ends up in an impasse, in a deadlock. I think this is a road we have to take. This is very powerful. I, I can see that road, and I I hope for for you, your country that you will try to travel it. Now, stay on the UN now, focusing a little bit on the UN and asking the question to the permanent representative mm-hmm. of Afghanistan to the UN, uh, which you are. After the withdrawal uh, of the US and, and NATO from from your country, how do you see the role of the UN in your country vis-à-vis? the geopolitical challenges that will be inevitably there, how do you see the, that role changing? Uh, I think we already see that, uh, that, that the role of UN uh, will be more prominent. Uh, the role of UN will be uh, much more stronger than what it is right now. The UN is, of course, a major player in Afghanistan, but the UN members are also strongly there uh, present. UN as an institution, we mean here. Uh, so, uh, and we all know that, that you know, we're sitting in here, uh, which is, you know, the, the base of the League of Nations, and, and the whole multilateral diplomacy, the idea is to, uh, to, to facilitate, to mediate, and to, uh, 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 to bring peace into the world, or even to support peace, to keep peace, to build peace. I think this is the main, the main mission of, of the UN. So uh, we see more role for the UN. And, and the, of course, uh, there are uh, perhaps on one side concerns about the efficiency of uh, you know, a UN mission, uh, the difficulty of a UN mission, the limitations of UN missions always, given we Afghans in that region, we got used to sort of a high-powered shuttle diplomacy of you know, major... Uh, special representatives moving around and, you know, banging their heads together in different places. And that's not the style of UN. UN has to go, you know, quiet. UN has to go calm. UN has to create a lot of consensus before moving. But but I, I see this as a diplomat. Maybe we diplomats, we are kind of, you know, laid back. Is that I see that as a strength, basically. I see that as a very positive, as an opportunity, because UN will offer a platform where the region, you're again talking of even neutrality about the region, a region which is uneasy among themselves, and they are have difficulties at the international level. If you talk of China, Russia, United States, if you talk about India, Pakistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the others. So when it comes to the UN, there they have to agree on something to move, uh, to move on. Of course, you know, we are, there is always the fear of paralysis uh, of, of, you know, Security Council. But when it comes to Afghanistan, I think the stake is high enough f- for, uh, for those countries to, to cooperate around. So I see an opportunity in UN's involvement because the region will be involved seriously. And the region has a confidence of working with the United Nations. Uh, and uh, a UN diplomacy in Afghanistan will be, you know, mar- much, much more settled and much more, uh, uh, let's say, inclusive uh, diplomacy around uh, making peace in Afghanistan. And at the end of the day, uh, that is, that's the platform we all have. I mean, if you have to bring either UN at the beginning or at the end or middle somewhere. UN has to be there when there is a peace. It's better for the UN to be much more and strongly involved. And I see this now that the Secretary General has appointed uh, 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 
a personal envoy for Afghanistan's peace specifically, you know, I am sure it will start with the facilitation. But what will be the mission? Because right now we have a peace building mission. It's called United Nations Assistant Mission in Afghanistan, which was built, which was mandated after the Bonn Conference, which was, you know, we entered an era of peace building. But at this time, there are, you know, speculations and discussions of how a new mandate will look like. A peacekeeping, for which we have a peace, which we have, you know, a ceasefire, and then peacemaking and back to peace building. To me, you know, personally, as, as a researcher, as somebody who's interested in peace studies and all this, it seems we are taking, you know, whole, uh, you're going in circular. Mm. So we, so we're going back from peace building to peace keeping and peacemaking. But you know, of course, it's not a, it's not a linear process. It's always, you know, up and downs, and sometimes circular. A little bit of um, focus on the region itself. Uh, talking about the future. There is a growing number of analysts who look at the region as a place with great potential. Demographics, economics, development, environment, all the indicators look uh, positive for the future of this region. Do you concur? What do you see for, for the region in the next, let's say, two decades? Oh, certainly, I think that is, um, that's one thing that we also uh, you know, uh, try to, to, to market, to sell around. That, that Look, the region has huge potentials. And then there is one flashpoint which creates problem. You know, it's a problematic for the region and for us. So, and that's Afghanistan. Otherwise, you have you know, all the routes coming uh, where uh, Afghanistan is as the roundabout of what we call the roundabout of Asia. So you're exactly right. So I think, and also, you know, normatively and in terms of, you know, the agreements, in terms of some of the infrastructure, including the roads, builds and the roads, including, you know, uh, some erosion infrastructure uh, and, uh, you know, India, Pakistan, all of this. So you could see that that, that uh, potential is there. And not only potential, but, you know, there's actually things are building around it. So a peaceful Afghanistan is probably the lost uh, 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 point in turning into this you know, potential into an actuality. Because, again, uh, Central Asia is full of resources, natural resources, energy. Or Pakistan alone, 200 million people, is a huge market for all those five Central Asian countries. Altogether, it's not as big as Pakistan in terms of their population. But in terms of the land, resources, water, we have abundant of water, reservoirs and fresh water in there. And then, you know, connecting India to it is, again, another huge thing. Iran, if comes out of the sanctions, if, you know, this uh, uh, negotiation could, could lead to something positive, and hopefully we are very much hoping, uh, that opens, again, another route to the sea. Uh, we can see the Gulf region as a huge potential. Already we have a business with it. So I think we, is the question is that, that we need, you know, a, an agreement on Afghanistan and a peace on Afghanistan. And it will take very little time for Afghanistan and for region really to raise, really to have you know, phenomenal growth. Because all the elements of a growth, as you mentioned, which are resources, natural resources, human resources, and uh, supply chains, uh, these are things are all, all, all ready and untapped uh, natural resources in Afghanistan. So I think this, this gives a very bright uh, uh, you know, vision and picture to anyone who try to uh, to keep aside this sort of you know uh, very uh, security approach uh, or security dilemma approach to every policy in that region. So I mean, uh, you can the security dilemma is a dilemma. That's why they call it dilemma. I mean, you can you can keep being in that dilemma for hundreds of years and nothing will come out of it. So if you move from what they call it, you know, from the geo strategic to geo economic. And this is where Afghanistan will also see you know, a very bright future. That's very powerful, and I agree with you, and I, I can see it. I can see it, and it's certainly um, a nice prediction to have for the future of the region and of Afghanistan. So as we wrap up, um, Dr. and Ambassador Andisha, if you want our audience to capture one or two key ideas from your mind or your research, your book, what would that be? I think the idea is that uh, going uh, and studying concepts in the uh, 
uh, international relations. I'm coming now, you know, as an international relations uh, student, but also as a diplomat, we have to look into, look out of the box. Maybe something looks very difficult for you to research because there are very few resources, or it looks far-fetched as an idea because everybody will tell you, you're crazy, think about this. But I think, you know, looking into this concept, going into uh, difficult solutions, innovative solutions, both, you know, as we diplomats, because we are entering an era of lots of uncertainties. You know, with COVID-19, who would have thought uh, that, you know, we will have a situation like this? Two years back, none of us, you know, as diplomats here in Geneva, we had all plans, all of things like this. Uh, so I think, you know, the, this era of lots of uncertainties are coming in front of us. Yes, you know, we become more sophisticated in terms of technology and the others, but more sophistication needs, you know, more innovative, out of the box, an unorthodox way of thinking, uh, both in industry and technology, but has to be complemented by, you know, diplomatic innovative diplomatic thinking, innovative thinking in international relations, innovative thinking of looking into the politics and security and intergovernmental inter you know communities uh, relationship. I think we need to we need to shake up a little bit our very sort of you know uh, traditional approach to peace, a very sort of you know liberal peace. Everything will be you know you create this this institutions, everything will be fine. I think my suggestion, especially for the younger generation of diplomats and researchers and scholars, is that keep persisting in uh, you know, unsettling and, 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 you know, questioning a very traditional way of uh, diplomatic international relation approaches and go deep into these uh, corners of the world where their problems could not be seen only from the lens of Geneva or New York when we are sitting here. Those are very complicated and those need sort of nuance and out-of-the-box way of thinking and bringing and including, you know, those thinking into our mainstream discussions in the high places. I could not think of better words to, uh, to wrap up this podcast. Ambassador Nazir Andisha, thank you so much for being with us on this episode. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'm, I hope that you know, the little book in the library can attract uh, you know, a number of people here. I'm not going to market it for them to buy it because it still is in the paperback and probably, you know, not affordable to, to, to the students, but it's also online. And I have also an article which summarizes this, uh, which is printed and is available in the, uh, in the internet for free with the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, which is called Neutrality of Honestness Foreign Policy. This guy basically, it's uh, connected to, to, to this book, but, but of course the book is more uh, refined and more updated. And, and I'm hoping that this is the base of further discussion. And I uh, hopefully, if I have time, Maybe I can expand it because here I discuss what neutrality is and then maybe next time I will see how it could be applicable to different places. And thank you very much. We'll be watching out for your next book then. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed that conversation between Dr. Nadir and Disha, who is currently the ambassador and permanent representative of Afghanistan to the United Nations in Geneva and our director, Francesco Pisano. If you're interested to know anything more about what the two gentlemen talked about in the conversation, please do not hesitate to head to our show notes where we have put all the useful links for you. If you would like to hear more from the Next Page podcast, please don't hesitate to head to our Podbean or you can find us on Apple or Spotify or wherever you find your podcast. If you would like to get in touch with us, please don't hesitate to reach out through the UN Library and Archives Geneva. You can find us on Facebook if you search for us, the UN Library and Archives Geneva. If you would like to get in touch directly with the podcast, please don't hesitate to use the hashtag NextPagePod and we'll make sure to reach back out to you. And that's it for me today. Bye for now. <laughs>